This is the fourth in our series, Spirit Led Living, six ways that we are changed forever. Now, I want you to understand that through the indwelling presence of God's Holy Spirit, our lives have purpose. We have a reason to live. We have a reason to rejoice, a reason to serve. Now, and some might ask, though, what, what is the Holy Spirit's purpose in our lives? He is that third part of God. He is the very part of God who comes and abides and dwells in us. But what's his purpose? Why is he there? What does he do? Some people would think that the Holy Spirit's purpose is to get us excited. And yes, he does have a purpose of energizing us and getting us, getting us excited. But is this his purpose? Some people would say that the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. And yes, the Holy Spirit's job is to intercede on our behalf, to help us to speak to God, even with groanings that we could not utter when we are so distressed. He does help us to pray. Some people would say that the Holy Spirit's purpose inside us is to bring peace to a troubled heart. Does He do that? Absolutely. He is called the Comforter. And he accomplishes all these things, but getting us excited, helping us to pray, and bringing peace to a troubled heart are not his main goals. In John 16, Jesus explains the primary purpose of the Holy Spirit. And his primary purpose is this, to always and forever glorify the Son of God. That's who he is. And that's what he does. There's three things I'd like to share with you this morning from uh, John 16. The first is this, that the Holy Spirit is always pointing us to God's Word. Always and forever letting us see what God has to say. In John 16, Jesus is sharing some very vital words and very important teachings with his disciples, with the eleven. Judas has already gone off. Judas was on his way to bring Jesus' enemies to Gethsemane so that Jesus could be arrested and so that the trial and the crucifixion could take place. And so Jesus, with the eleven remaining disciples, the apostles, really wanted some intimate time, wanted to talk to them about some things that were of utmost importance. And one of those things was the presence and the power, the purpose of the Holy Spirit. And so the 16th chapter of John is a passage in which Jesus is opening up and telling them more about this one who is to come. Really, we need to start at verse 5 because he introduces this to them and to us. He's talking about the fact that he's going to be leaving them. But he says, my leaving you is for your benefit. And he explains this in John 16, verse 5. I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you asks me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. One thing that the Holy Spirit does is he points us back to God. Now, he, he points us to God, and he points us to God's Word. Skipping down in chapter, in chapter 16, in verses 12 through 14, Jesus said, I have much more to say to you, more than I can share now, more than you can bear. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak only what he hears. He will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. The Spirit of God points us to what God declares. It points us to God's Word. The Holy Spirit glorifies Christ <coughs> excuse me, through the inspiration and the illumination of the Bible. We really need to talk about that. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, Paul told Timothy that all Scripture is God-spirited, or God-breathed. It means that what we have here in this Bible is inspired of God. It comes from Him. This is not just a book. This Bible that we have and that we carry and that we use is the breath of God. 
What I am holding today in my hand is what the Spirit of God has produced. And the scriptures tell us that this is God-breathed. It comes from Him. Now, many people will say, now wait a minute, wait a minute. This was a compilation of, of thousands of years of men's writings. And men make mistakes. They forget. They add to things. This book is full of errors. How can I trust this book when it took thousands of years of writing and so many different opinions coming into play? I need to remind you of what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. He said, No prophetic message ever came from the human will, but holy men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Word of God comes from the Spirit of God. And you're right, men wrote this thing. You're right, men are fallible. You're right, men make mistakes. And you're right, men forget. But that's not the question we're dealing with. We're not questioning with the fallibility of man. We are asking, is the Holy Spirit fallible? Does he make mistakes? Does he forget? No. If he is the Spirit of God, he doesn't. And if he's in charge of the writing, what we have here is from God. The Bible was written by men, men who were sinners. But it was written under the authority and the control of an infallible, sinless, third member of the Trinity that we call the Holy Spirit. This is Holy Spirit writing. And we can trust this. From Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, verse 21, from the beginning to the end, this is the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit's job is always to point back to what God wants us to know and what he has revealed. Another thing we need to remember about the inspiration of the Bible, the Bible is objective truth. Some think it's subjective. Some think it, it, it depends on the circumstance and the situation. It doesn't apply in all situations at all times, but it is an objective truth. And some people would argue the point. Martin Luther said this. He said, the Bible, I don't have to defend it. It is like a lion. All I have to do is let it loose and it will take care of itself. I like that. It is objective truth. The Bible is like gravity. We may not like gravity and we may not get excited about gravity, but guess what? We have to live with gravity. Four years ago when we moved, I backed a, a big U-Haul truck into our driveway. We had loaded the truck with the remaining things that we brought up here from Indiana. In loading the truck, I purposefully put the things on, at, at the end of the load, at the tailgate of the truck, that I knew needed to go into the garage. And so I backed the truck up the driveway, opened it, and I realized the load had shifted. And as I looked through some of the jumble and few things that were kind of cockeyed, I decided I was going to get up, I pulled the ramp down, I got up into the bed of the truck and I kind of crawled over uh, a, a metal trellis that we had uh, sitting at the very back and I decided that's the best place to start and I started the pull. And as I was on the right side of the truck starting the pull, it was stuck and so I gave it one good tug and I went off the back of the truck. And as I went off the back of the truck, within two seconds, I dropped four feet and hit the concrete. I can tell you, in the two seconds, I decided a minute had transpired because in my mind, all these thoughts were going through my mind before I hit the ground. Uh-oh, that was dumb. <laughs> now what? How am I going to land? This is going to hurt. All these thoughts rolling through my mind and <laughs> I hit the ground. I actually had enough sense to turn myself so that I hit pretty squarely on my hips. But as I landed on my hips, my thought was good and then my head bounced on the concrete. <laughs> And Khalid screamed. I was well enough to go ahead and go uh, to John Smart's father's funeral service that took place in an hour. But I couldn't tell you a thing now about what was said or what happened. Gravity is objective, folks. I wished it wasn't going to happen, but it did. It's something, the, the, the consequences of stepping off a four-foot rear end of a truck, you're going to, you're going to hit the ground and you're going to hurt. God's word is objective. 
It is solid. It is something we can count on. This is not just another book. These are the words of God. And these words of God are, are a tool for the Holy Spirit to help us to understand how we should be thinking. We don't need to rely on dreams or on signs or on some type of audible voices because God has already spoken and the Holy Spirit gives us this. And so let's understand one of the main purposes of the Holy Spirit is, as Jesus said, to be able to understand all things. He points us to God's Word. But secondly, let's grasp the fact that the Holy Spirit helps to grow Jesus' character in our own hearts. The Holy Spirit plants Jesus in us. He, the Holy Spirit, is going to glorify Christ by reproducing Jesus in Christians. We have already looked at this passage from Galatians chapter 5. We studied it a few weeks ago. We talked about the fruit of the Spirit. And in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is a singular process. But there's all kinds of fruit that develop because that fruit is growing. The fruit is really Christ-like character. We're like Jesus. When we talk about all this coming off the same tree, we're dealing with the fact that all the character of Jesus, as different as, they, as we see those characters of Christ or those characteristics of Christ, they all come from Him. And so the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience. It is kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. The Spirit grows that character in us. God, through the Spirit, can change our character. He can change who we are. We find ourselves responsible for our actions, and sometimes we think that we can pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and we can become better people. And to a, to a point and to an extent, that can be possible. But if we really want to see character change, we need to rely upon God. And that's what the Spirit does. That's who He is. He is the one who makes our character like Jesus' character. He is the one who helps us with some flaws in our lives. Suppose you have a problem with self-control. Suppose you know that you're a Christian, but you say, I have a temper, and you, uh, so because of my temper, don't mess with me. It's a character flaw. It's a flaw but that, results, that, that shows itself by the lack of self-control. But in Christianity, if we give ourselves over to the Lord Jesus Christ, if we allow His Spirit to plant Jesus in us, we start producing fruit that changes our character. And we let God's self-control become our self-control. Christ is glorified when we look like Him. And that's what He wants us to do. That's why the Spirit of God is implanted in us, so that we can look like Jesus to the unsaved world. And so that we can treat each other, the saved, the way Jesus would be treating us. In Romans 8.29, Paul said, Christ is the firstborn among many brothers. You know what that means? It means that Jesus is our big brother. And God wants the rest of us to look just like his son. He wants us to live like Christ. He wants us to exhibit the character and the characteristics of Jesus. And that's how he's glorified. When the fruit of the Spirit is growing, the fruit that, it, that is produced is glorifying Jesus. Jesus' character grows in our hearts. And so, yes, the Holy Spirit points us to God's Word. And yes, he grows Jesus' character in our hearts. But it's, in, it's important to understand that the Holy Spirit never glorifies Himself. Chris Edmondson said this. He said, the job of the Holy Spirit is to glorify, to make known, manifest, to put on public display Jesus Christ. Anytime the Holy Spirit gets more attention than Jesus Christ, you have a problem. The Holy Spirit is key, but He's key in glorifying Christ, not glorifying the Spirit. So whenever the Holy Spirit gets more attention than Jesus Christ, this is a misuse of the Spirit. In fact, 1 John 4 verses 2 and 3 say that any spirit that detracts from the Spirit of Christ is not the Holy Spirit. He is the anti-spirit. Anything that lessens the person and the work of Christ, no matter how nice it makes us feel or how excited we get, is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's job, His purpose, 
is to make us like Jesus and always forever point to Christ. So, if Jesus says in John 16 that he points us to God's word, if we are told through the scriptures that he also makes us like Jesus, we also need to understand from John 16 that he uses us to share Jesus' love. In John 16, starting in verses 8, 9, and 10, Jesus said this, speaking about the Holy Spirit to come, at that time, of course, he, he hadn't come before the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. He said, when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and of righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And, and in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. The Holy Spirit has a job to do, and one of his jobs is to convict the unsaved. He is here to convict the non-believers. You know, the Greek word used here for conviction is kind of interesting. The Greek word, if it were translated properly into our, into our modern English, would mean that he convinces or he clears up. He clears things up. He makes it crystal clear. When God convicts us through his Holy Spirit, he is making our sin crystal clear. He, we need to understand that we're sinning. The Bible says that the intent of man's heart is evil. And the Holy Spirit convinces people that they are sinners before a holy God. He understands righteousness. The first thing the Holy Spirit does is he helps people see that they're sinners. But the second thing he does is he shows that Jesus is the only way to get it right. Yes, we're sinners, but we can't, we can't correct that. We need Jesus. Because Jesus goes to the Father. He said, because I go to the Father, you'll understand what righteousness is about. Now get this. We have a lot of religious leaders that uh, have been admired through the centuries in this world. Jesus, after his resurrection, ascended to heaven, went back to the Father. No one else has ever done that. Buddha lived, but Buddha died. Muhammad lived, but Muhammad died. Confucius lived, but Confucius died. Ron L. Hubbard lived, but Ron L. Hubbard died. And Joseph Smith, who started the Mormon church, lived, but Joseph Smith died. Jesus is unique. He alone has gone to the Father and lives forever. And the Holy Spirit is convicting us of that. The Holy Spirit is also helping us understand judgment. The ruler of the world has been judged. Folks, some people don't think it's right for Christians to talk about hell. Some people think that somehow we can win people without talking about the need to be saved from hell. And in fact, there's some people who, are, uh, who want to live on their feelings. And one of the things I've heard many times from people over the years is this. I don't feel that a loving God could send someone to hell. And so I don't want to believe in some place like that. Well, folks, whether we want to believe in it or not, it is an objective truth. And here's the point. God does not send anyone to hell. We send ourselves. We send ourselves. Because of our sin, because of our... Uh, problems and our attitudes and our bitterness we send ourselves to hell God was not, is not here to send people to hell but God is here in our lives today to rescue us from what we deserve see the whole story of Christianity is not that God's going to send some to heaven and God's going to send some to hell the story of Christianity is we're all doomed for hell and God is on a rescue mission and his rescue mission boils down to this statement God so loved you that he gave his only son that if you believe in him you'll not perish but you'll have everlasting life did you get that one of those favorite verses we have in the scriptures John 3 16 talks about hell if you believe in him if you follow him if you obey him you will not what perish in hell the Holy Spirit is a convictor 
He convicts us to understand sin. He convicts us to understand righteousness. And he convicts us to understand judgment. And without the conviction of sin, there's no opportunity to share Jesus' love. When we talk about him using us to share the love of Jesus, there has to be some conviction first for us to want to follow the love of Jesus. In Acts 13, there was a congregation of believers in Antioch along the Mediterranean coast. So they were a strong group of Christians. And in Acts 13, verse 2, this, uh, Luke said this. He said, while we were ministering or while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul to the work to which I have called them. Now, I want you to understand something. When God calls us to serve Him, He doesn't call us from sitting on our hands doing nothing and waiting for some sign. Okay, now we get up and do something. The, the scripture is very clear. They were ministering to the Lord. They were already in service. In other words, God only will hit a moving target. We don't have to sit back and say, okay, God, what do you have in store for me today? Where do you want me to go? We just simply need to get up and do. We need to already be in service. Will Rogers said this. Anyone remember Will Rogers, the comedian from the first part of the 20th century? He said, even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. God looks for a moving target. We need to be moving for the, for the cause of Christ. We need to be working for the cause of Christ. We have formed six new ministry teams in this church. And in forming those ministry teams, we're not sitting on our hands. We say that we want to know Jesus, follow Jesus, and share His love. And we want each of these ministry teams to get together. Marsha just told us about some great opportunities for fellowship. We are moving, and as we are moving toward God, he is calling us to do even greater things. Jesus said this, When the Helper comes, whom I will send from the Father, that Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, He will bear witness of me, and you will bear witness also, because you have been with me from the beginning. That's what He said in the 15th chapter of John. The Spirit is coming to bear witness, but you're bearing witness as well, because you're already doing something. You're already working. The question we have to ask this morning is this, have we tuned the Holy Spirit out? Have we turned Him off? Have we been seeking other things to stimulate our faith instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to change us from the inside? Have we become so concerned with our performance that we have forgotten the substance of our faith centers around following Jesus? Not sitting for Jesus, not standing our position, but following Jesus. The Holy Spirit is a vital and essential part of our faith and of our life in Jesus Christ. At times, there is a very emotional aspect to it, to His presence. At times, He does minister to us in prayer. At times, He does give us comfort. But then there's other times he works very quietly, almost in the background where we can't see him. And he is accomplishing great things through us as we are doing the work of God. You need more power than just willpower in your life. You need God's power in your life. Rick Warren said that. We had a question asked just this past Wednesday night in our Through the Bible study, we were in the book of Galatians. We had looked at the fruit of the Spirit, and an honest question came up from the, from the students in the class. Uh, the question was, does the fruit of the Spirit come all at once, or does it need to grow? I thought that was such a good question. We're tapped into the vine. We are the branch. We bear the fruit. We grow. Rick Warren said it this way. He said, the fruit of the Spirit are qualities that God puts in our lives when the Holy Spirit lives through us. They are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How does God produce the fruit in your life? Not by willpower. You don't go out and say, I'm going to be a more patient person. That doesn't work. The Holy Spirit has to grow from the inside. You don't say, I'm going to be more patient. I'm going to be more loving. It's like some oranges uh, on a eucalyptus tree, hanging some oranges on a eucalyptus tree and calling the eucalyptus tree an orange tree. It doesn't work that way. Fruit can only come from the inside through His Spirit living in you. 
And so the question we have to ask is this. How does the Holy Spirit work in our lives? And the answer is this. He works gradually. He works gradually. We start bearing fruit. We start with love. And then the other fruit can come along. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul said, And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. It is a process. It is a walk. It is a lifestyle. When God wants to make a mushroom, this is from Rick Warren again, when God wants to make a mushroom, He takes six hours. When God wants to make an oak tree, He takes 60 years. The question is, do you want your life to be a mushroom or an oak tree? I think an oak tree. I think that sounds a whole lot better. We need to be patient. We need to let God's Holy Spirit grow God's purpose in our lives. And we need to start with the foundation principle of love. We need to start with love. That's where it all boils down. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God so loved Tom Cash. God so loved you that he gave his one and only son. That if you believe in him, you will not perish, but have everlasting life. While Christians were busy doing their work, the Holy Spirit said, set apart these two for ministry. He has a purpose. His purpose is for us to look to God's Word, for us to exhibit the characters of Jesus in our lives, and for us to share Jesus with the world. Isn't that pretty much what we say our purpose is when we talk about our mission being knowing Jesus and following Jesus and sharing His love? It happens as we get off our hands and start working for God. Don't be a naysayer. Don't say, oh, it's not going to work. Be a part of the work. And watch the Holy Spirit start to shape us from the inside out as we pursue His purpose in our lives. His purpose is the purpose of Jesus. And if you need Jesus, we invite you to come, to yield yourself to Him this morning, to obey Him, to, to, to be filled with Him, and to live for Him.